the lab on the composition of potassium chlorate in this video. So there's two objectives to this particular experiment and one is to figure out what the percent oxygen is in potassium chlorate using experiment and then secondly to confirm that the product you make in this experiment is potassium chloride which is KCl. So the first thing is just to talk about the reaction that we are going to be working on. And the reaction is a simple decomposition reaction. Decomposition reactions typically require heat to occur. So you can see that here's our reactant, which is potassium chlorate, KClO3, and we're trying to convert it into potassium chloride, KCl, and oxygen gas. And we do this just by heating a solid of potassium chlorate at very high heat in a container that's called a crucible until it decomposes or breaks apart into these two products. Now the goal here is really to determine how much oxygen we have in the original potassium chlorate. So what you will need to do at some point is figure out what the mass of potassium chlorate is and what the mass of potassium chloride is and when we subtract those two masses, we get the mass of oxygen. This is sort of like the idea of a conservation of mass, that the mass on the left side has to equal to the masses of the two products on the right side. Now, you might say, why don't we just weigh the oxygen? Well, oxygen is a gas, so it's not really possible to weigh it because when you heat it, it would just escape to air. As a result, we weigh the two solids that we have, and then we take the difference of those two solids. So the goal eventually is to calculate the mass percent of oxygen using your experimental data. And to do that, what you need to do is take the mass of oxygen that you just calculated in the previous step and divide that by the mass of the original potassium chlorate and multiply that by 100% and you're going to get your percent oxygen. Eventually you want to compare this to a theoretical number and see what is the percent error in your measurement. But let's talk a little bit about the actual experiment before we do those calculations. So one of the main things you need to do here is uh, heat it in a crucible. So a crucible looks like this container right here, which is shown at the bottom left. And it has a container and a cover. And it's made out of clay or ceramic usually, and it allows us to heat things inside it at very high heat. Matter of fact, this picture right here shows you when it's heated at very high heat. So the container, the crucible in this case, will not crack even though we're heating at very high heat because it's made of material that can withstand that amount of heating. Now, one of the things that we need to do is we need to do something called heating to constant mass. So this is a technique that is often used in chemistry. We're gonna keep heating the container and weighing it until the mass doesn't change anymore. So why do we do this? A couple of reasons. One is if your potassium chloride, your reactant in this case, and your potassium chloride, which is your product, look the same, and a lot of times we do have things looking the same between reactant and product. In this case, both of them are just white powder. It's very hard to tell that you've converted potassium chlorate to potassium chloride just by looking at it visually. So we can't see that we actually have our product. So in order for us to know that we have our product, we have to weigh it. And the weighing tells us that we have a smaller mass and smaller mass, of course, corresponds to that. But also to indicate that the reaction is complete, if all the potassium chloride has been converted to potassium chloride, then that mass should no longer change because all we have left at that point is potassium chloride. So that's one reason we do heating to constant mass. The second reason is we usually want to remove contaminants. So contaminants could be water that's used during an experiment. This particular experiment doesn't have water in it, but there's a lot of experiments where there's some solution, which is uh, water-based compounds that are used in the reaction, and we need to heat off those water. So we don't really know when the water is completely heated off unless we measure the mass, because we can't see those water. It's really hard to tell that a solid contains a little bit of water versus when it contains absolutely no water. So to do that, we would need to do this heating by constant mass. So the way we do this is fairly simple. First 
first we heat the container with the potential product and potential contaminants for some period of time, could be 10 minutes, could be 15 minutes. And then afterwards we would weigh the container for the first time. We would write down that mass and then we would take the container, put it back and reheat it the second time around and maybe for another 10 minutes or five minutes. And then we would weigh it again for that second time. What we will do then is we will take the difference between the mass of the second weighing compared to the mass of the first weighing. If the difference between those two masses is small enough, then we know that we are done with the heating and we have what we have in the final product. If the difference is too large, then we know that we're not done yet. So we're going to repeat the heating for a third time and we just keep repeating it until the mass is constant enough or small enough of a difference that we can accept that. In other words, there is a certain level of error that we are usually comfortable with. And at that point, then we can stop the heating. So that's heating to constant mass. Now what I'm going to do is show you a quick example on how to do the calculations with the data that you're going to get from this experiment. Do you have your potassium chloride to begin with and then you decompose it and you form your potassium chloride and the question is what's the experimental percent of oxygen in this particular data set so the student obtains the following data first uh, she weighs the empty crucible and gets this mass right here and then at the potassium chloride into it and then reweigh it and then get this mass and then afterwards heats it after heating the first time gets this mass and then after heating the second time gets this mass so you can see that there's a slight change in the mass from 11.483 to 11.482 but that change is acceptable within our standard of error for this particular experiment so we're just going to move on and say that that heating is done now if that's not acceptable if let's say it goes to 11 point let's say 475 then you might want to heat it this third time so in this case, we're going to calculate a few things. First, we're going to figure out how much potassium chlorate do we have at the beginning. That's just taking the difference between the first two numbers, giving us this mass. And then we try to figure out the mass of the potassium chloride. To do that, we're going to take the mass that is the last heating's mass. So we're not going to take the first heating, but we're going to take the last one. The last one happens to be the second heating. In this case, we're going to take 11.482 minus the empty container, which is 10.834. And that gives us this mass. Now remember that what you need to do after that is you need to take the difference between the masses of the two uh, species KClO3 and KCl to get the mass of oxygen that's exactly what we did here we take the difference of those two numbers that we just got and we get 0.419 grams that's our oxygen to get the percent oxygen we would take the oxygen's mass divided by the mass of the potassium chlorate multiply that by 100% and we get this as the percent of oxygen from our experiment. What you'll be asked to do in your actual experiment is also to calculate the theoretical mass percent of oxygen, which you can do by using molar masses from the periodic table. And then whatever your number is there, you're going to compare it with your own experimental mass percent and then figure out what is the percent error using those two numbers. That's part A of the experiment. Part B is to confirm that the product that you get after you do all this heating, which we call the residue, so the residue is whatever's left in there, is really KCl. We are assuming that it is, but we don't know for sure. So in chemistry or in any science, if you're not sure, you're going to confirm by doing some kind of a test. The test we're going to do here is a chemical test because we only have two things in there that's possible, right? Given our reaction, we can either have KClO three or we can have KCl. What we're going to do is we're going to do a test by mixing the residue with combination of nitric acid and silver nitrate solutions. Why these specific chemicals? Well, the reason is because if we have KCl, these two reagents when mixed with KCl should produce a solid white product or what we call a precipitate. Whereas if it's a KClO3, those two chemicals will not do anything. It would just look like what it was before. So it will be just a clear solution. So in one case, we'll see a white solid. In the other case, we would not see anything. We're also going to have two additional things 
present to test along with the residue. These two things are pure KCL03 and pure KCL, which we can purchase from a manufacturer. Why do we need these two things? These are what we call positive and negative controls. Controls are necessary because we need to know what the thing should look like and what it should not look like, right? So the KCL03 is a sample of a negative control, right? It should, if it's KCL03, which means it's not KCL, then it would just look like a clear solution. If it's KCL, then it would look like the white precipitate. So we're going to have those two things, pure samples of those two things as controls. And then we're going to have our residue along with it to see which one it looks more like. Does it look more like the KCL03 control or does it look more like the KCL control? Last step is to uh, do a cleanup uh, to make sure that you do this safely. So you have to discard or throw away all the products and unused reagents in the chemical waste container that you find in the lab. And then for the crucible cleanup, you want to make sure that you wash it well and dry it and then return it.